All that being said, I do want to throw it over to my co-host today and my colleague from our Northeast area, Matt Tripp says from Children's National Hospital. Hi everyone, so excited to be with you all this afternoon. Um, like Betsy said, my name is Matt Tripsis. I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director for our Children's Miracle Network Hospitals team at Children's National in DC. Um, and just really excited to speak with you all about building connections, building um, connections to your hospital, to your families, and how um, just provide an example of how our hospital supports our dance marathon programs in creating even greater connections to our cause. Awesome. All righty. So today, um, our objectives for this call and all the content that Matt and I have prepared for y'all today is to learn best practices on building relations between Miracle families and your participants, discover how to connect your participants to the cause beyond your Miracle family program, um, and develop tactics for collaborating with your hospital advisor um, to share the impact that Dance Marathon has had on your local hospital. All right, so to kick us off, we have a quick poll. Um, yeah. All right, so before we get things started, um, we'd love to hear from y'all. What is the first thing you think about when you hear cause connection? And I launched that, can y'all see that? There we go. Awesome. Seeing the results I kind of anticipated here. Matt, I know you probably agree. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. All righty. Well, we've got just about everyone's answers in. Um, as we kind of anticipated, um, does look like most people, you know, when we talk about cause connection as it pertains to dance marathon programs, um, a lot of folks are relating that back to their miracle families um, and their patient stories. Cool. Well, thanks, y'all. Um, moving forward, we're going to try that anotope, anot annotate feature. Sorry, words today, y'all. Um, and we've just got a couple questions, just curious to learn kind of who we have with us today and what your relationship looks like with your hospital right now and just the access that you have um, to different resources in your families. Um, okay. Think we've got it? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not sure that it's working. Um, all good. We're gonna move forward. We have a really great chat feature. Um, so let's use that chat folks. Um, so our first question for y'all today, just so Matt and I have a better idea of who we've got with us, um, is how far is your hospital from your campus? Right across the street. Wow. So lucky. 50 miles, not too bad. Two hours. Wow. Right by campus. Looks like 10 minutes. Right outside. On campus. Wow. Such a spread of like mm -hmm. miles away or right around the corner. Absolutely. All right. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, yeah, four schools. Yeah, so many of our hospitals have so many different programs supporting. Some are fortunate to be right down the street and others might be hours away. Um, awesome, well, appreciate y'all sharing that. Um, our next question for you to toss in the chat is, for those of y'all that have Miracle Family programs, um, is your family relations, hospital relations director able to communicate directly with families or does that have to go through your hospital advisor? So in other words, are you able to directly communicate with your families or is that communication that your advisor handles? All right, we have some not sure, advisors. Some of y'all can just text or email directly, which is awesome. Cool, thanks y'all for sharing. 
Um, our last question for y'all before we move on um, is how many Miracle Families do you have with your program? If you don't know the exact amount, just throw out a guess. Wow, 35. 60, oh my goodness. I love all the question marks. Um, it's hard to keep track as we, you know, bring on new families every year and we've got some that have, you know, graduated from the program. Um, but awesome, yeah, a new class of ambassadors. Awesome stuff, you guys. Um, well, again, appreciate you sharing and using that chat feature. Sorry, we couldn't get the annotate to work. Um, but yeah, it just goes to show to kind of set the tone for today's meeting um, is remembering that, you know, everyone, all of our programs come in different shapes and sizes and access to the hospital, families, distance to our hospital. Some of us, you know, maybe take those tours for granted um, when we're able to do those tours, just knowing that, you know, everyone can pile into a car together and drive 10 minutes down the road um, and others might be a few hours. So it does take a lot more planning and figuring out and maybe getting creative with that virtual space. Um, so yeah, just as Matt and I go through some of this stuff today, things that we want you to keep in mind is once again, all programs are different and every program's Miracle Family program is different. Um, you'll hear that from us today and then also content provided from some of our on-demand sessions as well. Um, everything we share today is not a one size fits all. It's just kind of foundational information to go off of. Um, maybe you'll hear something really great that Matt and his team do at Children's National um, that isn't entirely possible to completely copy paste to your hospital and your program, um, but some really great ideas that you can then tick back and modify with how it will work best for you all. Um, just things to keep in mind as you're taking notes today and um, trying to bring this back to your local hospital um, and the partnership that you currently have. Um, obviously our end goal by the end of today and why we do what we do with connecting our participants and our leadership boards and our donors with our hospitals and families um, is that we just want our participants and donors to discover the impact that they're having in their local community through donations to Dance Marathon. So gonna kick us off with talking about those relationships with families. Yes, we polled you earlier and it's, you know, what do we think of when we think cause connection? Yes, most of the time we do think of those families um, and those relationships are very important of how we connect with those families and connect them with our constituents. Um, so starting us out, we want to welcome those families into our dance marathon programs with arms wide open. Um, they are so much more than just a resource or a story. Um, they're people and their experiences um, matter and they bring a lot to show just the impact that you all get to make um, and how wonderful our children's hospitals really are and what they provide to these families. Um, so when we are inviting them and communicating with them about attending events or recording videos for folks, um, reminding them that they're part of this program. You know, that is why we reach out to them. We invite them to things. They're part of us. Uh, their kids might not be students at your university. Um, they might not even live anywhere near your campus. But one thing you do share in common is that you all raise money to support the local hospital in which they have a relationship with and their child is currently a patient or was a patient. Um, and so we want them to feel like they get to be a part of this movement and be a part of something bigger. Um, you hear so often from their family members and the kids themselves just how much they love going to the main events and how much they love getting to develop relationships with members on your board or meeting college students. Uh, you know, the day of your event or any time that they're invited to come around, um, the fact that these college kids think they're the coolest people just, just makes them so happy. Um, and it's just a cool experience for them. Um, so reminding that, you know, communication with them should go far outside just the asks and things that we want them to do for us, but also what we can do for them and make them feel welcome and part of our programs. Goes along with why they're, they're so much more than just that resource. Or some stewardship practices. Um, so thinking about what we can do to thank them for all that they have done for us and for being so willing to dedicate their time and share their stories and come out to our events. Um, 
most often we see programs on the event days, whether it's putting together a gift basket, writing handwritten notes, um, just having something prepared for them the day of to enjoy your main event, you know, whether that event was virtual, something we learned in this past year is we can easily mail them like their dance marathon survival kit for the day of. Um, but when we do make this steady shift back to being in person, having this stuff prepared for them the day of, you know, giving them their own space to take a step back from the big crowd um, and have a quiet place to just take a step back and enjoy their space. Um, other ideas are sending handwritten thank you notes, sending holiday cards. If you all put together like a program holiday card or something for the new year, Valentine's Day, whatever it might be, um, including them in that. Um, keeping them connected to your team and your program um, and just sending them something nice in the mail, um, even if it's just a quick thank you note uh, from a team member, just thanking them for their continued support and time that they pour into your program. Another idea is creating a thank you video from your team. Um, we've seen many programs try this in previous years um, and goes over really well. It's a resource that you can save and use again. Um, but it's also just a quick, easy way to stay connected with these families and thank them for all of their support. Um, whether it's an end of year video, thanking them for showing up to a miracle meeting, your main event, whatever that might look like, just getting to see your faces and knowing who it is that they're working with um, and knowing that you appreciate all that they've done for you is, goes a long way. Um, last but not least, this actually came up yesterday and thought it would be really great to bring up. Um, something that I feel like folks don't always think about is celebrating birthdays. Um, we're so excited as our kids continue to grow up and we get to be a part of that journey of watching them grow up. Um, so when it is their birthday, whether it's just a shout out on your social channels, um, sending them a little birthday package or a note in the mail. Um, if you're looking for more ways to create events with your families outside of just having them hop on and share their story, you know, host a virtual birthday party for your kid and invite them and their family um, and use that as a way to, you know, maybe it's incentive for a top fundraising team is, hey, you get to come join uh, Mason's birthday party, um, but just creates another activity and event to engage your team, your participants, potentially donors, um, but then also get to celebrate, you know, a new chapter of life with your family. And last but not least, remembering that Again, these families are so much more than just their story and just the patient themselves. Um, more times than none, when you're inviting a patient to your meeting, you're inviting a miracle kid to your main event, um, you know, the whole family's there. We see the whole family on Zoom. We see mom, dad, brothers, sisters, um, everybody is there and joining and having fun with us. Um, so when we're thinking of the stewardship practices and just the communication and outreach that we have with these families, um, remembering that it's so much more than just our miracle kid, but it's their miracle family. And that is why we call them a miracle family. Um, making sure that, you know, we're creating a close connection with the parents um, because ultimately they will be the deciding factor on a yes or no if a family can make it out to something or continue to support you all. Um, so making sure that we're looking at the bigger picture and doing what we can to support the family unit as a whole and outside of just the miracle kid of themselves. Some other things to keep in mind with establishing um, a good relationship with your miracle family and your team um, are those introductions and transitions. Thinking about after you have a full new team come on board um, and it's gonna be a lot of new faces that maybe this miracle family doesn't have a close relationship with yet, um, being intentional about that transition. So as you're transitioning, you know, your overall directors or your family and hospital relations, being intentional about setting up time to meet with your family members um, and get them introduced to a new student leader in charge, just so they can kind of put a face to the name with who they're going to be working with and who's going to be communicating with them. Um, I know a lot of you also shared that your hospital advisor is the one doing a lot of communicating with families, even if it's just a handwritten note just something to reach out to that family and introduce yourself and your role and knowing that they will be hearing from you and working with you this next year just goes a long way. Um, and then similarly, when you're doing transitions with your entire team, um, whether it's inviting that family to your first leadership retreat, 
um, or a big transition meeting, just ways to get them introduced from the start. So we're starting that year long relationship and connection with one another. So again, we're making them feel like they're welcome with arms wide open and still a part of this program. Um, something thinking about the lines of content with our families. Again, this is also something that you'll want to stay in communication with your hospital, um, making sure you're not overstepping any boundaries, but also covering any you know, paperwork that needs to be signed off, waivers, um, photo releases, things like that. Um, but thinking about if you're in a market that has multiple dance marathon programs and we've got families who are supporting more than one dance marathon, we wanna be mindful of their time. Um, and so creating schedules as it pertains to content, you know, if you want them to pop into a meeting or we need a recording or a video, whatever that might look like, being intentional about reaching out um, and scheduling this months in advance so they know and can anticipate what it is you're going to be asking of them this next year and it's not sprung on them so last minute. Um, especially these are people too, they live lives, they're busy, um, they got kids, so you know they're busy. Um, so just keeping that in mind when reaching out and asking them to do things for you. Doing signups can go a long way. Um, we've seen programs, you know, they send out that annual request of here are things we already know um, we will need from you. Maybe we need you to come to an event as we, again, ease back into the in-person event space. Um, letting them know well in advance. And if we have multiple families and there's different opportunities to, we just need six families this day, we only need one, giving them that opportunity to sign up with what's gonna work best with their schedule and what they can make it out to so that they're also putting it on their calendar well in advance. Um, and last but not least, media days. This is not something many of our programs do, but some that do have the tools and access to this, it goes a long way with providing content that they can then use usually for a couple years. Um, but working with your hospital to develop a media day. A lot of our hospitals do this already um, so that they have content from their ambassador families uh, to use throughout the years. Um, but some folks like to do it with their program so that they can get photos of their kids in you know, campus merchandise. We can get your school. They can wear a program t-shirt, um, but just things that are very branded to your program and your campus um, so that these are things that you can use on your social channels or for marketing, promotional, um, different things that you might need. Again, something to discuss with your hospital advisor and making sure that this is something possible to do um, and allowed. Um, but as I said, our programs that do have access to this and have done it, it goes a long way and it's really helpful for just keeping, you know, a whole lot of photos and videos and GIFs um, in stockpile to use throughout the years. Last but not least, things for you all to keep in mind as you work with families is that communication key. Um, I know I started to mention it earlier, but email etiquette, being intentional about how often we're reaching out to them um, and being professional, um, not just a quick text or no subject line and just like a quick little one sentence email, um, but being specific about what it is you're asking or looking for from them. Um, and not emailing them you know, every single day of the week or even once a week. Um, these are people with lives and we just need to be mindful of their schedules um, and giving them the appropriate time to, to get back to you with whatever it is that you need or are asking for from them. Another thing is utilizing different platforms, um, knowing that maybe one family doesn't really love email for communication and they'd prefer that you reach out via text um, or maybe they do want you to communicate through your hospital advisor. So. Identifying that from the start of which ways and avenues that we'll use to communicate um, and how often and just what do they prefer when it comes to all things communication so that we're one, not annoying them and two, um, know that we can reach them. Last but not least, frequency. Um, as I mentioned, if you're fortunate enough to have multiple families um, who you know, work with and support your program, um, not asking the same two families to come and do everything for you, but working on a communication schedule to reach out to these families this month, these families for a different month for a different ask, um, so that we're not blowing them up all the time, asking them to be at something or record something um, every other week. So again, just reminders, things to keep in mind. Um, they are people too, so we just wanna be mindful about um, creating a good and healthy relationship um, that keeps them wanting to come back and support each year. 
last but not least, creating that cause connection with your participants themselves um, and how we can get them in touch with our families and help them to better understand the story and the impact that they get to make on local kids in their community. Um, without going into too many details, because we do have a lot of great on-demand sessions of programs that are sharing really great ways to engage with our families and get them connected to our participants during our year-round movements. Um, it's just focusing on that year-round element of building those relationships. We have awesome content from Buckeithon at Ohio State University, um, San Diego State University, and then um, I have it on the last slide, but <laughs> anywho, we have a lot of great pre-recorded content that dives into some great year-round practices of how these programs are communicating with their families, offering different events and ways that they share their family story or engage them with participants outside of just that main event space. We also dive into, and granted the past virtual year has given us a lot of room to explore this opportunity of when families are not able to make it to our campuses, whether that's we're still in a pandemic and it's not safe. Um, for those of you who shared that your hospital might be far away and your families live out closer to the hospital and not so close to your campus, um, how can we still get them to connect and share their story and engage with the program um, even if they can't physically be on campus? And obviously Zoom is a really great platform for that, doing any pre-recorded content. Um, and some folks this past year have started to invite their families onto social platforms to do a live presentation or story share or activity. Um, and last but not least, how can we engage our families outside of just sharing their story? Again, you'll see this from our on-demand content and programs that have already shared. Um, but whether it is Zoom parties, um, inviting folks to campus to participate in an activity. You know, we've already heard their story. We know their impact and their connection to our hospital and our program. Let's invite them to do something fun. Um, whether that's a craft night or if it's a community event, whether it's a local event happening that's benefiting your hospital or it's a community event that you all are hosting, reach out to your families and offer to meet them there. If their family's got a time slot that they're hanging out at IHOP or a Walmart, um, offer to go meet them um, and hang out with them there and engage with efforts that they're still doing to support the hospital. Um, or a different community event that you all are already in the works of putting on. But bottom line is every opportunity that we have to continue to share their story and connect the family unit as a whole to our campus is what helps to rally our campus behind this cause. Um, we see people get connected and attached to these stories and the impact that they get to have. Um, and I'm about to show you guys a really great video um, from one of our programs and just how their campus was able to rally behind one student and his story. Um, and that's what really brings their campus together in supporting this cause um, is just they all really latched on. They all learned his story. They admire his strength. Um, and that's just something that they rally behind today as a program, even after, unfortunately, he's passed on. Um, so jumping into that now. What I learned is I need to stop share and jump into this, so bear with me. Appreciate the patience, all. Awesome. Um, so as I mentioned, and some of you might be familiar with Tyler Trent's story, um, but I love to share this video with all programs when I get the opportunity to do so. Um, the way that Purdue's campus and Purdue University Dance Marathon really rally behind Tyler's story um, and his impact on their program and their campus community and just the relationship that he had with their hospital. Um, they just do a really great job of continuing his story today and his legacy and keeping that alive. And that is such a strong part of driving their mission and bringing their campus together is through that cause connection of Tyler's story. Um, so here's, here's Tyler. Hi 
everyone has a story. There just needs to be someone willing to listen to that story. My name is Tyler Trent. I'm from Carmel, Indiana, and I am the Dancer Relations Chair. Tyler has always been relentless. He's relentless, he's efficient, he's a hard worker, he's smart. Um, you don't tell him no. So I dance marathon. Um, I sit on the board for Purdue Cancer Research Center. Um, so we meet every uh, couple couple times a year to review uh, researchers at Purdue who are looking into different ways to cure cancer and find um, different chemotherapies, different ways to attack cancer. And so we kind of help decide where fundraising goes in regards to Purdue's money into cancer research. Um, outside of that, um, I'm heavily involved in. Produce sports. I write for the Purdue Exponent um, as a sports writer. I'm not going to sit here and say uh, life isn't fair to me because I got lost sick on it three times. I'd rather go out and do something about it. So. I had told him that, you know, that there wasn't any way that I was going to be kind of missing starting college. In August, a week and six days um, before classes started at Purdue, they removed my pelvis and my hip February-ish. I started having some pain in my back, and so they did a biopsy on it, found out that it was a, a third osteosarcoma tumor that was growing on my L3 on my spine. be involved in a cause that is selfless, um, you know, it, it gives you an opportunity to get your eyes off yourself and, you know, onto someone who's probably in a much worse con condition than you are, um, and I think, you know, that's one of the greatest exercises for us as humans is, um, as the world is telling us to focus more and more on ourselves, I believe um, firmly that um, we should focus more and more on on others um, because I think it's through knowing others and um, being around others we're able to better ourselves. Maybe my drive revolves around the legacy that I leave and the fact that you know I, I don't the, the chances of me living to see cancer eradicated or us finding cure are pretty low, but hopefully, you know, uh, 100 years down the line, you know, maybe my legacy could have an impact towards that. You know, he's a perfect example of somebody that we need people to donate. Um, we're depending on new things to keep him alive. At the end of the day, money funds cancer research, and um, a lot of the money that uh, Purdue Dance Marathon raises uh, goes directly to uh, pediatric cancer research at Riley. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be alive being able to sit here today and do this interview um, if, if there wasn't research at Riley. Um, a lot of my cancer treatment nowadays has been a direct uh, result of the cancer research that. Um, had, that Riley has been doing, and that is a direct result of, of the fundraising money that people have been able to raise and, and donate to Riley. So all that being said, just want to wrap up this portion um, with our families, just to say that being able to connect our donors, um, our team members, our participants to our families and their stories, whether that's through fun events, our main event, um, connecting virtually, um, or just getting to know them as people and inviting them to have that opportunity to do so, um, just go so far. And when you're able to connect your campus, just like Purdue has had this opportunity with Tyler, um, it can really go a long way with 
pulling your campus together to rally behind this one awesome cause and continue to make that impact that we all hope to make with our local hospital. Um, my friend put it best the other day, uh, just like all of our campuses have our mascots. Uh, we like to say that our Miracle families are our mascots for Dance Marathon. And so it's, it's just very important for us to be intentional about how we include them and talk about them and share their story um, and keep them included in all that we do to support this mission. Um, because they're the folks who are really helping to drive home this mission and the impact. Um, but all that being said, I am going to hand things over to Matt now to talk about how um, outside of just developing those relationships with our families and getting them connected with our campuses, um, all of the other opportunities that come from your hospital and how you can connect folks with your hospital outside of just families. So Matt, over to you. Awesome, thanks Betsy. Um, and as Betsy mentioned, I'm going to dive in a little bit to um, provide examples of how our hospital specifically uh, helps to facilitate cause connection um, outside of our Miracle families. I mean, Betsy did a great job of highlighting all the various ways that Miracle families um, make our event and are really not only um, spokespeople for the hospital, but also um, representative of our programs as well. But I just wanna provide some other examples of how we um, create that at Children's National. Um, and something that Betsy mentioned in the beginning that I just wanna highlight again is that this is just one hospital's example. I hope that some of these, uh, what I share today helps to create a dialogue if you're a student between you and your hospital advisor and uh, figuring out what resources you all have um, your hospital is able to provide. So just wanna keep that in mind as I go through um, my few slides. But before I dive into the content, just wanted to give you a snapshot of who we are at Children's National. Um, so really briefly, we were founded in the 1870s. So we are celebrating our 150th birthday this year, which is very exciting. Um, we are ranked a top 10 pediatric hospital in the country. And for the fifth year in a row, our neonatal intensive care unit, our NICU was ranked number one. So very exciting. Um, and I hope that gives you just a really brief snapshot of Children's National. And then within our market, we have five collegiate dance marathons and four high school programs. So um, wanna touch on um, a little bit of the various support and cause connection opportunities that we provide our programs. One is Miracle Family Engagement. Again, Betsy did a great job of explaining how to, um, some best practices for engaging your family. So I'm not gonna dive much deeper into that, but note that that is a huge element and area of cause connection and support we provide our programs. Um, one is that we also utilize our hospital space to facilitate cause connection. I know that this can be difficult for those who are further away, but we do, um, we're grateful that many of, mostly all of our programs are less than an hour away from our hospital. So they're able, when we were able to have visitors come in, we were able to host retreats, provide tours to not only our student leaders, but also our dance marathon participants. So just another way of demonstrating your impact and dance marathons impact inside the walls of the hospital. And then additionally, as we have our families come and speak and share their stories, we also make sure to invite hospital staff, um, clinicians and leaders within our hospital so that they can provide a, a unique uh, perspective of the impact that dance marathons have on our hospital. Um, so obviously with the pandemic, it really forced us to think differently and take a pause and assess how we can continue to facilitate cause connection in a virtual space. So um, we were able to do that in a few ways. Um, I, from my experience, I found that we had almost increased access to our hospital staff, our patient families, um, we were able to facilitate a lot of interaction via Zoom, uh, via our Dance Marathon social media channels. Um, a number of them hosted like Miracle Family Q&As with an older family that also 
an older child that had an Instagram and they were able to facilitate um, a really great interaction via Instagram Live. Um, the second bullet I'm going to jump back to in just a minute. Um, we also created a Dropbox of digital assets for our program. So with nine programs, we everybody was really asking for the same thing, patient videos, statistics about the hospital, um, just all those things that you all are looking for to help in your marketing and communications and demonstrating the impact to your participants. So we made a one-stop shop for our dance marathons where they were able to go in, see all these digital assets. We had families submit um, like interviews and some fun like activities and videos and things like that, as well as um, things that we created from the foundation from the foundation in terms of like at a glances, one pagers with all those great statistics and information about our hospital. So our dance marathons really had a one-stop shop for any content they were looking for. And then additionally, we also uh, really started and dove in into this idea of continued education specifically with our foundation staff. Um, I'll be the first to say, for example, I'm certainly not an expert in marketing and communications, but we have a whole team at the foundation who is dedicated to that every single day. So for our students, we hosted, we call them lunch and learns, where we hosted a series of um, learning opportunities via Zoom. And we had those experts from the foundation come and speak to our students about marketing and communications events. Um, and a few other of those really important topics that you all are constantly thinking about and working through every single day with your programs. Um, however, one of the biggest things that we really found that we were missing was those tours. Our students really communicated that it was so such an impactful part of their experience to talk about the hospital, talk about the great things we were doing, but be able to see all of that in a physical way and see um, where their funds are really going and where their impact is. So I'm really excited that we were able to create a virtual tour for not only to share with our student leaders and demonstrate the impact, but for our programs to share with their participants and have that extension of the hospital outside of the walls. So really excited about that piece. And I am actually going to go ahead um, and share my screen and share with you all the virtual tour that we created, um, because I think it's just a really great resource that we have now at our fingertips for our programs. So bear with me just one moment here. All right. Hi there, my name is Maddie and I'm your Children's National Hospital tour guide today. Children's National holds a special place in my heart. My brother Mason has spent a lot of time at Children's National because he was born with a heart defect and had open heart surgery. The team of doctors and nurses that care for my brother are amazing. I'm also an orthopedic patient and I'm thankful for the amazing care I've received. Did you know that Children's National has cared for kids like my brother and me for over 150 years? The hospital opened in a Washington DC row house with just 12 beds after the Civil War. Today, it has 323 beds and is one of the nation's top 10 children's hospitals and is number one for newborn care. I can't wait to show you around and introduce you to some of the healthcare heroes who make Children's National such a special place for kids. This is the main atrium. It's where patients and families check in and can relax before appointments. Often, they can see fun performances on this stage. Speaking of fun, let's check out Seacrest Studios. The DJs here host tons of fun programming that's broadcast in the patients' rooms. Kids can even host their own shows about anything they want. My brother Mason loves to show off his awesome DJ skills. Seacrest Studios is amazing. It helps you forget you're in a hospital and just be yourself. Our next stop is the Diabetes Care Complex. We host all the endocrinology and diabetes appointments here at the hospital. That includes appointments with dietitians, psychologists, and social workers, so our young patients can have a one-stop shop experience. We offer everything from eye examinations and multidisciplinary clinics to our one-on-one -on -one training in our gym facility, 
and classes on the fundamentals of healthy cooking and eating in our Black Bear kitchen. We also sponsor clinics for patients with Turner syndrome, thyroid disease, disorders of sexual differentiation, and gender dysphoria. Our complex opened in 2013 thanks to $5 million in fundraising. Today, friends like you are helping us expand and adapt to meet the growing health needs of children and teens. Thanks for joining me to learn about what we're doing in the Diabetes Care Complex to help children grow up stronger. Next up is another one of my favorite places in the hospital, the Healing Garden. The inspiration for this garden was a patient whose last wish was to go outside. The heroic efforts of the care team made this wish come true, and our staff made a commitment to make it easier for all children to access the outdoors. The Healing Garden was designed to meet the unique needs of all patients. That includes power outlets for specialized machines and accessibility for wheelchairs, crutches, and IV poles. Each flower and plant here was also picked to ensure the health and safety and to bring the smiles to their faces. We opened in 2017 thanks to the support of hundreds of donors, including the family of Bunny Mellon, who helped design some of the White House's most famous gardens. The Healing Garden is named in her honor and dedicated to the First Ladies of the United States, who have long tradition of supporting Children's National. The garden ensures patients and their families have a place to get outside, enjoy fresh air and sunshine during their stay here in the hospital. We also host lots of fun activities, arts and crafts, movie nights, a winter wonderland, and our annual July 4th celebration. The bubble parties might be everyone's favorite though. When my brother was in the hospital, there wasn't a healing garden yet, but we had an amazing child life specialist like Angelica who helped him get through the long stays. Our last stop on the tour is the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, or NICU. The NICU is where nurses, doctors, and care providers treat the tiniest babies. In addition to having the latest technology, the Children's National NICU was designed with input from parents and families to create a soothing and secure environment for their child's recovery. We are a 66-bed Level 4 NICU the highest level awarded by the American Academy of Pediatrics. That means our little patients and their families receive the best care possible. Our highly trained neonatologists are supported by specialized pediatric surgeons, neurologists, pharmacists, and so many other subspecialty experts. A dedicated team of more than 200 nurses cares for these babies 24-7. We also have an amazing parent support system to help families who are often going through the hardest moments in their lives. We even have a NICVIEW camera system to connect parents who can't be here in person with their child. Our integrated multidisciplinary approach is part of what makes our NICU so special. It sets the standard for neonatal care across the country and is a big reason why we're number one in the nation for newborn care for five years in a row. It's a huge honor to be number one in the country, but it's an even bigger honor to care for the tiniest patients at Children's National and their families. What you saw today is possible because of generous support from people like you. Take it from me, your gifts make a difference. If you want to learn more about how you can advance pediatric health, please reach out to a member of the foundation team. Awesome. So, um... Again, just super excited to have that resource and also want to note, it was really a labor of love. So we didn't, it didn't just like come out of thin air and we were able to produce it really quickly. Um, so just want to note that for students who might be turning to their hospital advisor saying, we need a virtual tour. There are many ways of facilitating something like this, um, but we were able to get resources together to put together this virtual tour and we're very grateful for that. Um, so just briefly, um, as we're thinking ahead and thinking about transitioning perhaps and hopefully back in person, uh, what, what that's gonna look like for us. Um, we're still going, and I also wanna know some of the other ways that we um, help to create cause connection for our families or for our students. So. Um, we provide in-person and virtual volunteer opportunities through our volunteer services office. 
um, so that students can have an elevated engagement with our hospital. And we also offer a number of volunteer opportunities through our foundation, whether that's supporting our Race for Every Child, which is our annual signature event, or other events that we host. Um, our perspective at Children's National is we really treat our dance marathons much like our top end corporate partners. So they're often invited to foundation events and other initiatives, uh, much like our corporate partners are, and we are able to engage them in that unique way. Um, and now that we have really nine programs, we try to create as many opportunities as possible to for those individuals, those students to come together, lean on each other, learn from each other, um, almost like many collaboration meetings that many of our areas are hosting um, throughout the fall and throughout the year. Um, but just one note as we, again, continue to hopefully get back in person soon is that we're gonna really take a hybrid approach to cause connection. Um, we found that our family has really enjoyed being able to like jump on a Zoom or jump on Instagram Live, not have to worry about driving to campus or everything around that. Granted, many of our families are so excited to get back with our students and we're really excited for that as well, but we learned a lot and created a lot of virtual resources that we're gonna continue to use. Um, I saw in Slack just earlier that Dr. Carroll was actually responding to a couple of questions just from her main stage discussion. And something that she said that really stood out to me was we must normalize a hybrid approach. And I think that is so true to talking about cause connection as well is that um, we're able to engage with a hospital staff and families in unique new ways now. Um, and I don't think that's going to go away. So um, I know for us, we're really excited to continue um, engaging with our families and our hospital and hopefully facilitating cause connection in um, ways that we just haven't in the past. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt, just for sharing all of the wonderful things that you all do at Children's National. Um, Again, we brought Matt here today just because Children's National does do a really great job of, with so many programs in their market, uh, keeping them in contact with the hospital, with families. Um, and as he mentioned, you know, they go above and beyond with getting them connected to staff members. They've got the wonderful virtual tour. Um, so all of that being said, just if we have any hospital advisors here today, um, would highly encourage you to get connected with Matt and his team. Um, and if we have students here today, I uh, hope that you can take some of these ideas back and work with your hospital advisor to figure out what will be the best approach and some opportunities for you all to try to expand upon this next year. Um, but we will go ahead and get started with some questions. Um, if anybody has any for either myself or for Matt, um, feel free, drop it in the chat. Feel free to come on speaker as well if you just wanna ask. Um, but we will just take a couple minutes to answer any questions that y'all might have. Yeah, I see in the chat here, um, Allison was asking what kind of volunteer opportunities are available virtually. Um, so a couple that we have at our hospital, um, just off the top of my head, is that um, we ask individuals to um, like read a story via Zoom and record it and we send that in to um, our patients so it's like reading them a bedtime story. Um, we also have um, other opportunities to just like engage directly with some patients, um, play games with them, um, some, some things like that. So those are just a couple of those opportunities. If you're interested in learning a little more about what those are about, feel free to jump on Children's National Volunteer Services website and all those virtual opportunities are listed. Absolutely. All right, looks like we've also got, how do you suggest getting a smaller university um, or community involved with the cause? Um, Really, I think it's um, Peyton, depending where you all are located and how close you are to your hospital. Um, I think thinking about some of the things that Matt and I touched on today, um, 
while we did say not everything will be copy paste to every campus, uh, we tried to cover the foundational elements of what makes up a good cause connected campus. Um, and so I think really just working with your hospital advisor to figure out what will work in your community and on your campus. Um, with a smaller campus, I think you might have a really great opportunity to um, really connect with a patient and their story and their family. Um, similar to how even Purdue, as large a campus as they are, were able to rally so many people behind Tyler's story and um, connection to their local hospital. Um, I think that's a really great opportunity that maybe you and your team have with a smaller campus is the smaller the community, the easier it is to try to get everyone well-informed and educated and able to rally behind one cause. Um, so I think working with your hospital advisor to figure out some materials that they could share with you all, any information, and just as you hopefully return to campus this fall, um, be able to provide those in-person opportunities to bring people together um, and just host information sessions, um, maybe less on the frills of Dance Marathon and more focused on the cause itself um, and helping people to better understand what it is you all do and who you're supporting and where your impact is made um, would be probably the best place to start. And then Matt, maybe you might have a good answer for this one, but from Jenny, we have, how are you able to motivate families to participate virtually? Yeah, absolutely. I was just kind of mulling over this question as you were speaking. And I think we have, we have about, don't quote me here, but I believe between 15 and 20 families that we work with pretty regularly for our Children's Miracle Network um, programs. And there were certainly some who were really craving like engagement and doing something. Their parents were like, oh my gosh, you have anything going on? Because our kids are like bouncing off the walls. So we found that some were just more motivated and interested in engaging than others. And we really leaned into those uh, families in opportunities that we had, um, game nights, that sort of thing, um, where those families that were really craving it and certainly acknowledged the space that some families might have were looking for um, from us for now during the pandemic. And we'll certainly revisit what their engagement is going to look like in the future. Um, and with that, I also saw that um, someone asked, what in-person virtual events have you found the Miracle families enjoyed the most? Um, a couple that I just mentioned were we were able to facilitate like a game night with families. Um, one, we actually did, one of our programs did like a baking night where um, actually the family from the uh, virtual tour jumped on and they all baked cookies together. And it was just like this really cute opportunity to do something really relaxed and get to know the family a little more. But one thing I'll say is we really like poll our families and ask them what they're looking for. Um, I, my colleague Kelly is actually going to be sending out a survey soon say, asking all our families, like, what programs are you interested in engaging with, whether that's the dance marathon, radiothons, or corporate partner programs, um, but also, like, what events would you be interested in? Um, I think just asking our families what they're looking for and what would be fun for their kids um, is a great place to start and figuring out what would be best for them. Yeah. And Matt, I think your response right there ties into Sam's question that we see in the chat, which is what kind of events have you found successful to engage older miracle kids? And right, instead of, you know, trying to decide that for them, go straight to your resource there um, and ask them what it is they'd like to do. You know, what are they interested in? What would be fun for them? Um, and I guarantee whatever comes from that is something that they'll have a great time. Um, you know, anything with Miracle Kids involved, your participants will come out to. Um, so it'll be fun and a success no matter what. Um, a couple ideas that come to mind. Um, and again, this stemmed from just a conversation with the Miracle Kid and their family of just, hey, like, what do you want to do? Because um, this particular kid was, I think, 16. Um, and so he wanted nothing more than to hang out with a bunch of college girls. So <laughs> asked for a movie night because he knew that's who would be there. Uh, so they just rented one of those big inflatable like movie screens and plugged that in. They just supplied snacks that were really cheap or were able to get some stuff donated um, and just literally hosted a movie night. It was just a night for everyone to come out and hang out with 
uh, this miracle kid and their family. Um, and yeah, I know Matt also had said this in his uh, part of the presentation as well. Um, but some of those older kids are probably your better option to go live with on Facebook or on Instagram. A lot of them, especially Instagram, um, have their own accounts. So as long as we get permission from, from parents, um, going live with them and doing, you know, a Q and a, uh, we've seen folks hop on there and maybe it's baking with the kid, uh, they're cooking their favorite meal, uh, but just different uh, creative ways to engage with them online. Um, just because they are a bit older, they live on social media. So <laughs> with permission, doing something fun with them in that live setting. Um, but yeah. All right, any further questions? I think we're gonna wrap up here just to make sure we can give y'all a quick break before heading to our final um, main stage of today, but really great questions in the chat. Would love for y'all to keep those going um, in the Slack channel. Real quick, before we head to our wrap up, um, these dis discussion questions have all been shared with um, the workbook that has been shared with everybody this weekend. Um, so just as you continue to take this content back to your programs and keep that conversation going, these are just some really great questions to start that conversation um, and start the brainstorming session with you and your team. Um, quick wrap up just to highlight some points that we talked about today um, is just to always be intentional with the relationships that we build with our families and our participants. Um, do your best to work closely with your hospital advisor to develop intentional cause connection with your hospital and also what will work for you all um, in your community and on your campus. As I mentioned earlier, we do have some awesome pre-recorded content um, that also focuses on hospital and family related best practices uh, from San Diego State University, so dance marathon at SDSU, Ohio State University with Buckeye Thon, um, and then Qthon with Quinnipiac University. Um, all great examples that they talk to. So definitely encourage y'all to check those out. And then obviously reference back to the discussion questions that we just shared. Last final reminder, um, you will continue to hear this from us, um, but please make sure to join us on Slack if you have not done so already. We have a family hospital relations Slack channel Matt and myself are both in there along with our student leaders who are sharing on-demand content. Um, so please feel free to drop any questions in there. Happy to answer. Um, for those of you who maybe didn't wanna be put on the spot here today, uh, feel free to share questions in there. If you have any really great practices that you'd like to share, drop those in the Slack as well. Um, and then just continue to stay connected with one another throughout this year ahead. Um, we're all navigating it together, and this is an opportunity to always continue to grow and try new things. Um, so I really encourage y'all to stay connected as we do that together. Um, obviously, connect with your cause partnership manager, whoever they might be, um, with getting your donor drive page set up. And know that we have so many resources available. You saw that we have the new website launched, super exciting. Um, and we have a final finally made that jump from all resources living in Dropbox to now asset library can be easily accessed through that new website. Uh, awesome. And so before we let y'all go today, um, another small plug reminder, download that new Dance Marathon Donor Drive app if you've not done so already. You can do so with the QR code here. Um, do it ASAP. If your page is up and running, jump on that $100 fundraising challenge and get the awesome sticker incentive. They look great. I really want one myself. Um, and last but not least, we just have a very quick poll just to get some feedback on today's session. Um, and here you go for those of y'all still with us. But cool, once you've submitted that, um, thank you so much for joining Matt and myself today. We appreciate you all being here. We hope you learned something new today. And again, please connect with us in the Slack channel if you have any additional questions from um, our presentation today. But enjoy the rest of your DMLC. Thank you all.